We're cocky. We're like, yeah, I've got this. We can do this. I think, you know, we step up where we've got a cockiness to us that we can, you know, stand on the world stage and feel confident we've got something to offer. Hi, I'm Jenny Cooney, film journalist and host of the podcast Aussies in Hollywood. I'm very excited to introduce NFSA Presents Inspired, conversations with some of our great Aussie creatives in front of and behind the scenes about craft, talent and ambition. And I'm very excited about our guests, Hugh Jackman and Deborah Lee Finesse. Hi, guys. Jenny Cooney. Our pleasure, Jen. Good to see you. Hollywood yeah, legend, you Jenny too. Cooney. <laughs> so let's start with your first or most influential Australian cinema memory. For me, I would have to say my brilliant career, Judy Davis. I was inspired and by the freedom, by the beauty and just it was so... And performance. And performance and it was so Australian and so real and I loved it. It was magic. The first, hmm, I don't know if it was the first, but one of the most influential was Gallipoli, Peter Weir's film. And I remember going to Ian Drew's birthday party and we all went. We were 12 or 11 <laughs> and we all went to the movie and... All of us were crying at the end. Mark Lee, at the end, that final shot, all of us crying, sat in a, like, not a usual Australian 12-year-old birthday party. All boys, you know, it was, but that, that, that a man from So River, Tommy Burlinson. Yeah, yeah. He later went on to be our roommate. <laughs> My roommate, Tom Burlinson, exactly. I did live with the man from Snowy River, but we don't talk about it. <laughs> So let's talk about films, music, stories. Which ones do you find yourself going back to and why? Oh, we just recently showed the... Oh, go on. No, we say it together. What? The movie we go back to. The... <laughs> the castle! Oh, the castle. <laughs> I was sure you were going to say the way we were, which was... No, that's not an Australian movie. That's movies. Barbara Streisand. Got it. Um, no, the castle... Is because we just watched that with their kids, and that that we love showing that uh, to and and I love all their films. That team made a lot of great films. What was the other one with? Um, Break well, the dish. The dish. That's it. Mm. But Break and Moran, uh, Year of Living Dangerously. So many great Aussie films. We sort of have this bold, eccentric, left of center really individual uh, tone to Mad Australian Max. movies. I yeah, go back to Mad, Mad Max. Max. Oh, I remember that. Oh, 1977, I think that was. I okay. remember, yeah. I was very young. I don't remember. Yeah, I remember going on the Manly Ferry over with my brother to see that at Greater Union. I'm taking you <laughs> way back here, Jen. Sorry. Um, and But Peter Weir's films for me, yeah, I go back to them magic. again and again and again. So what do you think is the secret sauce for Australian cinematic success? Exactly just that. We are authentic. We, we're not trying to copy... American films or, you know, Scandinavian films, we are authentically, I think we're, we're doing us. We, we have our own personality as Australians. We have our own uh, culture and sensibility. And I think our films really show that due to all the films I just said. I think it's our authenticness that people are attracted to because it's unique and it's different and it's, you know, people are drawn to it. I remember when I went over to study acting in Perth, they said the great thing about going there is you're sort of isolated from a lot of Australia and you're insulated in the school. And, I, and we're on a global scale. And if you think back to all those movies that I grew up in the 70s, 80s, Australia, we, of course, had influences from Europe and England and we had influences from America, but we were so far away making our stories our way. So I'm, it's another way around of saying exactly what you're saying. And also I remember George Miller telling me that you're incredible. You have to be incredibly disciplined as an Australian filmmaker because the budgets weren't there. You couldn't just throw money at, at a problem. You had to solve it with wit, with ingenuity, with creativity, because you couldn't just whack up a green screen and solve a problem. You had to find a way. And he said, those actually restrictions make you more creative. And maybe that's part of why Australian films have such a distinctive flavour. When you've got those boundaries in place, exactly, you have to be more creative because they're your boundaries and budget is a boundary and it does mm. make you more creative. 
I also think, sure. sorry, with the secret sauce is getting very big right now, but lots of ingredients. I also think the sort of courage, I, I would say Australian filmmakers and actors, there's a real sort of have a go sort of quality, like go for it. Um, and we're cocky. We're cocky. We're like, yeah, I've got this. We can do this. I think, you know, we step up where we, we've got a cockiness to us that we can, you know, stand on the world stage and feel confident we've got something to offer. So um, when you reflect on your careers, uh, what does ambition mean to you both? For me, Jen, I think I'm, I've certainly way exceeded any possible ambitions I had in terms of uh, I never remember thinking I want to go to Hollywood and I'm going to be in big Hollywood movies or I'm going to host the Oscars or I'm going to you know, be on Broadway. I don't remember thinking that at you all, did. but I do remember feeling I'm just going to say yes. I'm going to work incredibly hard, but if I get a shot at anything, I'm going to say yes. I didn't really care what that was. I thought to say yes, no matter how frightening it is, no matter how, even if you don't feel you deserve it yet or whatever, say yes, go for it, give it everything you got. And I think, I actually think that sort of have a go mentality is a very Australian thing. Um, work as hard as you can and make sure you have a good time while you're doing it. Yeah, that's the most important ingredient. If you're not having fun, change careers. But I was the same, I said, I said yes. I came back from studying in New York and I think I got offered three films in the same week and my agent said, we can only do one. And I said, why? Why? I can get a, a helicopter and I can fly in there. And I was like, I was doing everything within my power to make it all happen. So you got to say yes to everything in the beginning because you don't know what's going to kick. You don't know. You just got to try to do it. So what element of filmmaking craft fascinates you beyond the one you're already involved with and why? Well, as I just said, for me, directing, I love the idea that you can have an idea. It's like a canvas. I paint too. So to me, directing is having an idea. I directed a short film, which was an idea in my head. And then you get a team of people in all their areas of special, of, the, of expertise that come together to create that vision. And what was in your head, you get to see play on the screen. And then you get unexpected things that happen along the way. To me, it's like magic. I, I, I'm fascinated by um, just letting it be what it's gonna be too and trusting the work that it can morph into something unexpected too. They're the little darlings that you get along the way. So to me, the, the art of storytelling through directing is really exciting. Um, for me, it's the camera, I guess the camera department, working with those great cinematographers and camera operators. And in particular, it's gonna sound odd to you, but I'm really obsessed with focus pullers. So for people who don't know what that is, when you see a movie, you know, obviously the actor or whoever's saying the line or whatever it is you want to focus on has got to be manually adjusted in camera. Is that still? Still manual. They I mean, still do the focus puller? That's the not focus done? puller is there, no. Uh, it's still amazing they to me. They haven't thought that up how to do that. And so it is the most stressful job for anyone on the film set because it doesn't matter. If you have Daniel Day-Lewis giving the greatest performance of his career, if at the end of the day, the director calls cut, print, and the focus puller goes, ah, sorry, I think I missed a little bit. If, if he's moving, it's over. You haven't got anything. So there's See, so I much pressure. Be a focus puller. Oh. That pressure would kill me. So I remember one shot on Australia, Baz, it was the scene where we go to the island and we're rescuing the boys that had been on the island, the indigenous boys who were there. And it was me running and Baz had a long lens, which means he's a long way away with a wide open lens of 150, which means the depth of field is about this. So the camera's about 60 meters away, like half a hundred meter race, 60 meters away. And yet, and we're running, he's moving and I'm running to him. And the whole time he's got to be adjusting oh. with this much degree of, of, of error. And he got it. It took us about four takes, but it did a miracle that he got anything in focus, let alone the whole take. Oh, oh well, if this, if this film thing doesn't work out, you've got another career. You could. <laughs> oh, no, I, I'd be sweating. I'd be shaking. Yeah. It'd be horrible. I'd be the <laughs> whole time. Nice sorry, 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 guys. Sorry. It's a nice shout out. <laughs> um, so what does the National Film and Sound Archive mean to you? 
I think it's it's confidence for us as Australians to see our, our legacy through all the generations of filmmaking, where we've come from, where we're going to, and that's how we learn. So the future generations will learn from the past and see, you know, what it was like to make a film in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and so on. And it's it's commemorating some wonderful work. So it's 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 wonderful to keep that memory. I couldn't have that perfectly said as always. Done. But I, I think that if I could just add to that, so much of film is about new innovation, finding a new way. I, I think it's really and really important and a way to, um, as you said, track, not just honor the past, but to track it, to understand and know uh, where everything fits in, in the present. And it so tells a story because you don't, you know, in history, that's how we, we, we know about the past is through the artists, mm. through what the stories we're told. That's how we know about where we came from, who we are. It's the artist stories, that the representation through painting, through music, through filmmaking, through books. So it's important to you both that, you know, the work of all the creators are collected and preserved and shared yeah. to inspire future generations. Yeah. Absolutely. I think it's terrific. I think yeah. uh, I, hats off to everyone there doing this work. We're thrilled to be a very small part of it and to be able to help out, but it's a wonderful legacy for, it will be for generations. I'm glad it's happening. And you've both got plenty of work in there, but also shame was something that uh, got to come back again, restored thanks to the NFSA. Yeah, that was remarkable. It showed in New York at the uh, film uh, festival there in New York. And it was so amazing because I made that, what, like 90, and it was still so potent and pertinent today. It was great to, have my daughter in the audience as a 15 year old seeing her mother kick ass on a motorbike number one but you know it was great seeing the audience react in exactly the same way the outrage the connection and sadly that it's still true these these stories are still resonate in what's happening in you know not just the outback in the cities today so yeah that was great to have that you know brought back and that was a great experience I was really proud of that film I love the character I love what I had to say and I know a lot of Australian students studied that film, so I'm proud of it, yeah. It was really Great. awesome to watch my kids, our kids, watch their mum in shame. Particularly as Ava was probably 12 or 13, yeah. so just coming into the sort of Teenage. womanhood sort of thing and, and Oscar, who was 16, 17, seeing her mum totally kick ass. So it was, it was awesome. They were scared of me after that. <laughs> So uh, the NFSA is opening Australians in Hollywood, an exhibition that celebrates all of what we've been talking about. What in your mind, I know you've sort of answered it, but what in your mind is, is there to celebrate? Uh, I think there's a really rich history and legacy of Australian films, many of which people won't know about. Uh, I think Australian actors right now and, and, and certainly over the last, I don't know, 40 years of directors and crew members have been really well celebrated, but there's so many gems. There's so many gems that have, need to be revisited, need to be watched. And if you're Australian or if you're a film fan from anywhere in the world, I think going and watching the uniqueness of Australian film watching some of the landmark filmmakers, storytelling, the actors, uh, and those incredible locations. It's, uh, it's something I feel very proud to be part of. I know you do too, Deb. And, and let's face it, we as Australians, we love to celebrate. We could celebrate <laughs> daily. We could celebrate everything. We like to celebrate, and why not? Every day is a miracle, and I think it's great that we get to celebrate what we do. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, which Aussie inspired you? I know you mentioned Judy Davis, but others as you were coming up in your career. And who currently inspires you? Who should be on the radar of the NFSA in Australia? I go back to Wendy Hughes uh, and John Hargraves. That was quite a way back, but they were both powerful, strong actors. And I remember thinking how good they were. And I was sort of proud to go, they're Australians and they're really kicking ass. Yeah, um, certainly for me, Judy Davis was one. Mm -hmm. As I was really getting into it, the reason I decided to become an actor was Richard Roxburgh. I saw him mm -hmm. doing something at the Sydney Theatre Company and I didn't know acting 
could have that effect actually at that point. So I'd say Richard Roxborough, who's done a lot of amazing work, Hugo Weaving. Um, my dad took me to the high school I was going to be going to, to see their musical. And he was the lead in that, Man of La Mancha. And I can still remember it completely. They went to the same school, yeah. Ben Mendelssohn. Yes. Who I loved growing up. Uh, um, and then I, even now he incredibly inspired me. I agree. Me. I and, think Ben Mendelssohn is a wonderful actor. And Jeffrey Rush. I was a huge fan. I saw him on stage a lot. And then, you know, when I saw Shine, I was like, oh, so it's okay. So you can do theatre and film. So I would say Jeffrey has to be one of them. And I'm impressed with up and comer, well, up and comer, she's sort of established, Margot Robbie. Me too. Um, I think she's done great work. You know, she's, I think she constantly challenges herself in the role she chooses. I'm yeah. impressed with what and she's I'm been doing. Inspired by Nicole yeah. Kidman, who I was lucky enough to work with. Deb's very good Another friends Another roommate. <laughs> shared a room with all these guys. And to see how she's just through the years keeps the quality of work and now and she's stepping out of her safety zone. Producing yeah. yeah, she's always taking yeah. risks. Yeah. She's probably one of them here, but did any other Aussies help you in the early days of your global career? Yes. When mm. I first arrived in Hollywood, a young journalist named Jenny Cooney. <laughs> she helped me too. I just landed and she goes, Deb, we're doing a story. You've just landed. I haven't done anything yet. She goes, doesn't matter. Let's get the word out. Actually, that was last to the finest. It was with Brian Dennehy. Oh, it was too. Yeah, and you I came remember that. on the set and you did a story. So, yes, I'd say another Aussie was Jenny Cooney when I first landed and you were oh, so supportive. So and, lovely. Yeah. True. And what about uh, Nicole, other? Nicole, for sure. Uh, she was very supportive to me. And uh, Tom Merlinson, who uh, we now got parents to his kids, but he was very, very helpful to me early on how to navigate things. And this, you know, they call it the Australian Mafia. I think it was at uh, your son's first birthday party where you pulled me aside and said, there's a group here of Aussies across not just actors who are always going to be there for you. And that, you know, when you're in LA and you're starting out, that's really, really helpful. And we're still all tight, all, our, all us, you know, the gang that we start out with, we still see each other. We live all over the States and Australia, but we're still close. Oh, so what's your advice to Aussies looking at this dreaming right now of making it in Hollywood? Be Go for very it. careful Go for it. what your objective is. Making right. it in Hollywood, if making it in Hollywood is your dream or being a fine actor and telling stories, um, Hollywood to me represents its, its enormous opportunity. The, you know, it's, it's the workplace for actors. There's so many films being made there. But just to pursue uh, success or fame in showbiz is a very different dream to really wanting to hone your skills and, and be an artist. I've got two bits of advice. One actually came from Deb. When I first was going over there, I'd, I'd shot X-Men, but it hadn't come out. And you said, the trick to Hollywood is always have a return ticket. So the mistake some people make is take a one-way ticket and then sometimes, and you said, but, you know, don't forget you, that you can work in Australia, you can work at these other places and keep fires burning in different areas. So particularly if you have a career or things going in Australia, it's really great mentally and creatively. Go in three months, audition, do the thing. If you don't grab a film, go home and work. Don't just sit there waiting for work when you could be working somewhere else. And the other bit of advice I would give about Hollywood, this has gone out of my head. Literally, as I was saying, it's gone out of my head. I did have two, but forget it. Let's just go with Deb's. Have a better memory. <laughs> just to have a better memory. Sorry, it's gone. That's it. I'll remember it as soon as we hang up. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you to, to Hugh Jackman and Deborah Lee for um, sharing all that wonderful inspiration. And um, to those watching, stay tuned for the next episode of NFSA Presents Inspired. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, Jen. Thanks Kay. to the NFSA. Really appreciate it.